I'm here again with Tim Smith, our historian, um, and we're in the event center of our new building. Um, in addition to being our historian, Tim is the director of education here and is going to be actually doing many of our programs in this room. Tim, you want to talk about some of the programs that you're going to be giving and maybe we can uh, walk around the room too a little bit and give people a sense of, of, uh, of what it looks like. In sure. Here. You know, um, we're, we're really hoping that our giving regular programs, we can attract people from the community and from around the country who are coming to visit the battle uh, and the battlefield so that we can give events such as, uh, you know, civilians in the town during the battle. We have a program called Caught in the Crossfire about the civilians and what they went through during the fighting. Um, we'll probably do something uh, on a regular basis on the Eisenhowers. We have a uh, a uh, program about uh, Native Americans uh, artifacts and uh, we have some programs where uh, we're hoping uh, especially for children to have some hands-on activities maybe to uh, we have one called debris of battle where we can uh, uh, get them to see what a bullet uh, looks like and feels like and maybe an artillery shell and uh, talk about the people after the battle and all the debris that was left on the battlefield after the fighting was over and we also have regular events uh, in, you know, scheduled for our event center, and we're hoping that other people will rent our event center and have functions in here. Uh, we already have some local groups that will be using our event center on a regular basis. And one of the interesting things about the event center is the fact that we uh, have an overlook onto the northern section of the battlefield and out towards Barlow's Knoll. So early on, when we were building this, uh, constructing this facility, uh, and you may notice if you go out uh, along Howard Avenue and look over towards us, that the side of the building looks like a house and a barn. And so we have these windows that look out across the area where some of the fighting took place. And uh, you know, it's very attractive as a rental facility. Um, so we're really hoping that uh, to generate money to support the historical society on a continued basis by using our event center. That's great. Yeah, and this room seats about 140 people right now the way we have it set, but it can accommodate up to 200 if we remove some of the tables. So we really can't wait to have all kinds of history programs here, events, speakers, lectures, uh, book signings. Um, and we've got a lot planned for the next year. So if you're not already a member, hope you'll consider joining us. We're, you know, obviously we have a lot of discounts for members and a lot of our events will be free and open to the public as well. And, and of course, if you look on the Adams County Historical Society website, we do have a calendar of events and we are starting to put on uh, public events that will hold in the next year. So we will have uh, free events on Saturday and Sundays that you can come to in uh, programs, I should say, in our event center, but we'll also have a series of different kinds of um, seminars and paid lectures that you can attend also. That's great. And, and I don't know if you mentioned, I was looking at some of the comments we were getting in, but we'll have a, a small exhibit up here on Barlow's Knoll, which is located directly outside, and including some artifacts that were discovered during the construction of the building. Some of you probably know this was the site of our Adams County prison for 50 years, 60 yeah, years? 1949 to like 2003. The Adams County Prison was at this location, and we actually purchased the property from the county. And in 2004, I believe, in 2005, we actually paid to have the prison removed. Right. That was part of a, an agreement we made with the county to replace the structure with a much more suitable structure, and to eventually occupy it with our collection and have the public come in and enjoy the space. So. Um, it was it was a it really worked out for us to have uh, this location to be able to be here in a centrally located area. Um, but anyway, we want to take you around and show you some other parts of the building as well. I see Tim smiling. Does he have a? Oh, I was just thinking say? that one of my original <laughs> plans when we first talked about having the building was I wanted to have jail cell doors that you walk through into the event center. Oh, no, no, we can't do that. <laughs> Wouldn't that be great? I'm sure a lot of people are going to be agreeing with that now and asking me why we did not do that. So anyway, Maria, maybe you can just pan around the room a little bit, and we're going to head into the next space. Uh, we know everybody's time is precious and valuable, so we're going to walk through as quickly as we can and give you just the highlights of the building, and then you can come and see it when we open in April. Uh, we're walking now into the research room. I also want to point out we have a, a staff member, Michaela, on Facebook, and she is going to be answering questions. If you have any questions, please put them into the 
the comment box. And again, we have a really nice match tonight, $18.63. So if you can donate, it would help us out a lot tonight to complete our capital campaign in the next month or so, which we're hoping to, to finish. Um, so Michaela has questions. If, if uh, any questions are more historical in nature and you want to send them to Tim, uh, Michaela can uh, text them to Tim and we will try to answer you. Uh, I would look at it, but my phone is recording the program tonight. So, uh, Tim, what room are we in right we now? We are in the Charles H. Gladfelter Research Room. And this is one of the uh, interesting things about our uh, capital campaign, that we were able to uh, raise money uh, and our rooms were dedicated to people. And um, it was a donor that requested that we name our research facility after our longtime director, Charles H. Gladfelter. So this will be the room you'll come into if you want to do genealogical research. And just like it was at the Wolf House or the seminary building when we were there, uh, the old dorm, uh, we have our Civil War library here, and we have our research library, and we have research tables that will soon be uh, put together in uh, a chairs and conduct, it'll accommodate uh, a good amount of people. And you'll be able to request genealogical records, and we'll bring them out to you with our uh, staff and volunteers hard at work. Right, and a lot of people do come in to research the Battle of Gettysburg. We have, I think, one of the most impressive collections of books related to the battle. Yeah. Um, especially if you have a soldier that fought at Gettysburg, you can come in and learn about their story. Uh, we also have hundreds of civilian accounts of the battle, which is one of our favorite parts of the collection. Letters and diaries and newspaper articles written by the, the eyewitnesses who were here in 1863. And that is really one of the focal points of our museum downstairs as well. So uh, we're excited about this research room. We're excited about every room, of course, because it's all new to us. We've only been here about a month. We've been unpacking every day. We're trying to get more and more of the the collection accessible. Uh, I think we, we've made great progress in a few weeks thanks to our uh, volunteers and staff who've been working overtime to make this all possible. And you might notice that the lights went off in the archives and as we walk into it, the lights will come on. So, uh, this is, uh, of course, our archives room. And as we walk into it, you can see we do have a larger amount of material in here uh, shelved and uh, in archival boxes. And for the first time in many years, our entire archives is in one place. When we left Schmucker Hall, the old dorm, and moved to our temporary location at the Wolf House, we had to separate our collection in several different uh, locations. Um, one of them, an all storage location where stuff was packed. And now, it is, we're in the process of unpacking all of our archives and shelving it, but for the first time, we have all our newspapers back and all our archival material that was in the Wolf House. So it, it's very exciting to look at some of the stuff that had not been available to us for many years. Right, and we have all the Adams County newspapers, but also all the Gettysburg newspapers from all the way back to 1800. Uh, and the newspapers of the time of the Civil War, which are fascinating for us to look through uh, and read about what they were writing in our local papers during and right after the battle. Um, so yeah, this is a, a very uh, put together part of the archives. We're still working in toward the back to get things unboxed and onto shelving. But this is one of the things that has just saved us. It is a high density storage system. I'm sure some of you have seen this before. Uh, but as Tim is demonstrating it, winds open and then allows us to compact our collection onto these beautiful racks um, that are made of metal and really durable. We also have a concrete floor here on top of a steel deck with metal siding all around. So it is a really secure room with climate control and fire protection, which is something we have never had for our collection. And I just want to take a minute, too, to thank all of the people out there who've donated to our capital campaign to make this possible. This is the result of that right here. We are standing in a room full of the rarest historic materials in this town, in this community, uh, and they are now for the very first time safe. And we don't have to worry about uh, going home in the evening and thinking about whether our collection will be here when we get back in the morning. So it's just an enormous um, honor to have all of your support to make that happen. Um, you want to maybe of course, talk about a few other things here. On this shelf we have estate papers, all the estate papers of everyone who's died in Adams County. I think we have them in our collection from 1800 all the way to uh, 2011. Uh, we have tax records 
from each of the townships and boroughs in Adams County from 1800 up until about 1960, I believe. So if you're researching a property, we have that available. And, you know, a lot of these records we actually received uh, from Adams County itself. So, you know, in part, we are the archives for the county as well as the local historical society. That's right. right. And on that wall, we have, uh, in, uh, I don't know how many boxes, hundreds of boxes that are subject files related to any topic you could possibly imagine researching. If you're researching a location on the battlefield like Devil's Den or Little Round Top, of course you should read Tim's books on, uh, on some of these things first. But we have files on anything you could imagine, a church, a local school, uh, a cemetery, uh, any kind of landmark, any famous person like Thaddeus Stevens who lived here in Gettysburg for many years. Um, a tremendous amount of research that's been compiled over the years that's accessible now when people will come in starting uh, in April after we open. The most interesting thing I get to tell people when they've come to visit, we've had you know a couple groups come on tours uh, to see our new facility. And uh, everybody's amazed that this stuff on this shelf we just moved in less than a month ago. So this stuff was just all put on these shelves <laughs> relatively recently yes. by uh, a large amount of our volunteers. Yes, it's just an unbelievable amount of progress in a very short time. But we wanted to get these things safely onto the shelves as fast as we could so that we can begin to have things organized for our opening in April. Uh, we also have a lot more newspapers here. I just wanted to point out, this is every single published issue of the Gettysburg Times from, what, 1907 to uh, 19, the 1970s, when they probably stopped binding them that way and started doing things um, in a different format. But uh, any issue of any local newspaper we have, uh, we search them a lot online, but it's also nice to have the original copies in case uh, we, we need to find something that, that we can't get anywhere else. Um, and then I would say we have a, just an unbelievable amount of old books. And some of these books, um, you know, are, are more valuable for research. Others are more just antique books owned by local families. But we have yet to kind of sort through this. Um, I do see here, I think some of these older books are from David Wills Law Library, the attorney who hosted Abraham Lincoln uh, in Gettysburg at the, at, in the November of 1863. Uh, we have other books that belong to prominent local families, directories. We have yearbooks. Uh, just about everything you could imagine uh, from the community, uh, and, and including more newspapers that we're still putting onto the shelves. Should we give a little peek back there, too? This is something we're also really proud of. Um, so, you know, you could, uh, you, could, you could buy an art rack from a con conservation company for, you know, forty or fifty or $60,000, but we decided to try to be more economical, and we actually bought some chain-link fence that works just as well to hang prints, frame prints, oil paintings, um, old maps, and so uh, that wall filled up very fast with, with our frame materials, in fact, faster than we hoped it would, uh, but we still have quite a few other framed items that we're going through and trying to clean, and, and we'll display some of those throughout the building. Um, so why don't we head this way? Uh, Tim, do you want to point out the hallway just for a second, because we're planning on doing something yeah. interesting here. So um, we do have a large hallway upstairs leading uh, from our offices down by the event center to the archives down here. And, you know, we have a lot of wall space. So uh, we're planning on hanging uh, artwork on our wall space uh, around the building. And then, you know, we can rotate the artwork that we'll have on display as time goes by. And we just have so much framed storage. If any of you had been in the museum, in the old dorm at the seminary, uh, you know, every inch of the wall was taken up by some framed display. So uh, that had been in storage for about 12 years, and now we have that, that stuff back, and we've unpacked it, and we're thinking about exactly what to put on the wall where. So that'll happen relatively soon here. As much as you would like to, we are not going to cover every inch of the wall of this building. Not every inch, <laughs> no. We're going to head downstairs now. I just want to make one more point. In addition to what you just saw, we have probably over 10,000 objects in our collection, three-dimensional mm -hmm. items. And we have a separate storage building yeah. back behind our main building that is also climate protected, great security, great fire protection. Um, and that, that holds all of those larger items. Um, so it's a massive collection. You've only seen just a tiny fraction of it in the last couple minutes. Uh, but you'll have to come in and do research and visit our museum. We'd, we'd love to show you more of what we have. So we're going to head downstairs now. So we're going to try to monitor any questions that you have.
Um, if there are any specific questions for Tim, um, Michaela and our staff will, will text him. We'll try to be aware of that. And we're coming into the downstairs lobby. There's a couple interesting things that we're going to do in this area of the building, including um, to my left, Inside this smaller room, which is kind of packed with uh, um, some supplies and, and uh, tools that the museum company is using to install the museum, that will be our changing exhibit gallery. And it will be the home of our first rotating exhibit, the rare photographic collection of William A. Frasinito, a well-known Civil War historian, a photographic historian as well. And so that will be in that room um, opening in April for you to come out and see. And I expect that uh, Bill Frasinito will be around quite a bit to... Uh, um, to interact with the visitors in his space there. Tim, you want to tell us about this area? And oh, well, this is our downstairs uh, concourse. And uh, not only do we have an area with windows and we'll have some benches and maybe some artwork, and this is an area where people can congregate who are maybe coming in and waiting to go into the museum or, you know, uh, going into the exhibit gallery. But also, this area uh, along the wall here will be... Uh, display cases that will house sort of uh, rotating temporary displays. And we have three display cases uh, going in um, right away. And um, one of them will have a display right here of um, original manuscripts and publications by civilians here during the battle. Um, it's about the civilians in the fighting. And then we have a display case um, with uh, um, uh, black voices. We're going to have stuff uh, about the African American community here in Gettysburg. And then we have a third display case that will have some items in it relating to the making of the PBS series, The Civil War by Ken Burns. Uh, and we're really excited about that. Uh, and as we walk down the hallway here a little bit. And I'll take this m moment to maybe announce something we haven't announced yet, but in that one exhibit that Tim just mentioned about Ken Burns and the Civil War series, we're going to be displaying the actual video camera that Ken used to create the Civil War series. So you'll have to come out and see that. Again, that'll be in our lobby. It'll be a free exhibit that you can come and see. In addition to the changing gallery, those will be free and open to the public at all times. We hope you'll also go into the museum while you're here and see uh, the experience we've put together, which we'll show you in just a second. Michaela did have a question. Okay. Uh, Michaela, Jeff asked, when we were unpacking collection, mm -hmm. did you find something that surprised you? Wow. I can tell you what surprised me. Yeah. You know, I wrote a book about Devil's Den, and in my book on Devil's Den, I have a chapter on the photographers at Devil's Den. And I think I have something in there about how there were nine different photography firms that were active at Devil's Den between the years 1884 and 1930, and they recorded over 50,000 images of people in front of the rocks of Devil's Den. And I unboxed this uh, framed item, and it was a framed photograph from Devil's Den by the Devil's Den Photograph Company from wow. like 1888, and it was a company I had never heard of. So, I mean, you know, it's, it, I don't even know where this was in Schmucker Hall. So we did unpop, uh, unbox things that we did not remember having uh, because some of it had been boxed when we moved out of that location 12 years ago. But then there are other things that I didn't even know that we had in the old building, and then they were boxed and were unopening them. Right. Yeah, I mean, I'd say we found a lot of things. The things that stick out to me, I think we found two or three boxes of David Will's law book, which I mentioned, yeah. the books that were in the Will's house when Lincoln visited on the shelf in his office. Uh, we found boxes of those that we had not known we had, and all of them are signed by Will's, and so you open them up and, and you see that kind of thing. But yeah, every time we open more boxes, I think we're excited, even if it might not be exciting to, to everybody. That's right. Um, but uh, it, it's definitely been interesting to, to see what we remember we had, what we didn't know we had. When we open the newspapers, you know, it's fascinating, I think, to page through the volumes and see uh, the news of the day. We happened to be opening the 1912 Gettysburg Times, and I wanted to look to see what they had said about the Titanic sinking. And uh, the first issue after the Titanic sank, the headline was, small issue with iceberg, or something to that effect. Um, no problem, everything's fine. Then, of course, the next issue was a little bit different. 
Um, so uh, it's fascinating to see, you know, to go into a, a moment in time and think about what the information they had at that time uh, was like and how it differed from the reality. So, so we, we have a lot of three more questions. That. Is Gary going to be allowed in the building? I don't know. <laughs> um, Gary's been here several times already, and he comes here on a regular basis, maybe like once every two weeks, and walks around and checks out the building. So he's he's very much involved in the project. Gary Edelman, my co-author and uh, good Civil War buddy. Um, we had another question. Uh, um, is Tim working on any new books? I'm always working <laughs> on a book. So I have like three books in process, and who knows if they'll ever get done. We're really, really busy with the museum. You could... We could argue that the museum is a book. I would, I would say that the museum is <laughs> is the magnum opus for Tim. And then uh, I had a third it, question. It, that was from sure. Olivia about what we're doing for dinner. Oh, okay. So well, I don't yeah. know. I don't know if she knows I'm doing She might not know, that. but she'll have to watch this then and see that uh, you were in the middle of a video when that text arrived. Okay. Uh, what is this, Tim? This is one, I have to say, one of Tim's favorite things in our museum. Maybe not... One of your favorite things that you'll see, but still, uh, we're pretty excited about this. Well, I think, I think, you know, one of the, uh, we have ideas when we were working on the museum concept, and one of the ideas I had early on was, wow, we should have a Mason Dixon uh, crown stone in our museum if we're going to tell the story of the Mason Dixon line. And I did look and uh, online, and there were some uh, Mason-Dixon markers that have been replaced over the years along the line, ones that went missing and somebody had replaced. So I knew that, you know, people had made replicas of them. So our museum company uh, and our, um, uh, I guess, our production people. Fabricators. The fabricators, yeah. Um, and also, you know, the museum designers, they thought it was a great idea too. So they made this replica. It's not... 800 pounds as the originals are. But this is a crown stone. Uh, every five miles along the Mason Dixon line, they put a crown stone. So there's a mile marker, and then there's a crown stone. And on one side is the, the Penn family crest, and on the other side is the Calvert uh, family crest. So, the Maryland, Calverts of Maryland. Pennsylvania. Yeah. And we have a little exhibit in the museum. We'll walk through that area in a moment and show you, but where we talk about family crests and emblems and and the process of how they actually got these giant markers to the line. Of course, Adams County is on the Mason-Dixon line. People sometimes might not realize we're only eight miles from Maryland here in Gettysburg. Uh, so why don't we head toward the museum? I do want to point out on the way there, at the end of this hall, we have a small meeting room. Uh, we're calling it our seminar room. It seats about 20 people. We'll have a lot of school trips that come in and have a, a, a group of, of students in there. We might do smaller meetings, smaller programs, film showings, that kind of thing, down at the end of the hall. And right here, we are at the front door of the building, and you'll see our, our very uh, very big um, and, and long front desk area, which we hope will be a buzz with activity after we open in April, uh, with also some monitors behind it to display information. And of course, our gift shop. Tim, maybe we could set up the gift shop for a minute. We'll save the museum for last, because we are so excited to take you in there. Uh, very few people have seen it, uh, and it's really coming along. So Tim, we have a a lot of books here. I think your books are actually in a box waiting to be put onto the shelf. Well, I, see, I see three of my books. I see three of your books. That's pretty good. <laughs> uh, this is, you know, the gift shop's going to have all kinds of products, not just books, but we are starting to put together the titles we're going to carry. We have every book that Jeff Shera has ever written and published. He's a good friend of ours. We love his stuff. Uh, we also have some books by our friend Brad Gottfried, Jake Borick, The Boar Borick. Um, I see Tim's books. I see uh, Sue Boardman's books. Uh, I see Susan Eisenhower's book. Um, many, many titles, uh, kind of a, a recreation of the topics that we have in the museum. So we have civilian accounts in the battle, we have Eisenhower, we have Thaddeus Stevens, and more. I was just going to say, yeah, I think um, when you go to the museum, we try to have books. You might see something in the museum you're more interested in than buy something about that subject, like Eddie Plank, or uh, Thaddeus Stevens, or Jenny Wade. Got to have a book on Jenny Wade. Yeah. And we even have uh, down here in the corner, oh, yeah. Uh, we'll have a children's section, and you can see there are books on dinosaur footprints in the museum. And we will show you in just a second why we have books and, about uh, dinosaurs. Native Americans <laughs> in Pennsylvania. So, um, you know, first Pennsylvanians. And, you know, we've looked over the years and we try to get the best book on each of the topics that we are interested in covering in the museum. Wonderful. 
All right, so we will head into the museum now. We'll give you a, a little preview of how things look right now. You know, we have a couple months until our opening, but things are really coming along every day. It changes in that space, and uh, we could not be more excited about it. I think this is the first program where we've ever taken people into this space. It's about 5,000 square feet, and again, it's called Gettysburg Beyond the Battle. So that is the story we're telling from the very beginning of what this community uh, was, even before people arrived, um, all the way through to the present. We want to tell the story of this place and this, the people who lived here. Uh, it's the human interest story of Gettysburg and of this area that I think is badly needed, um, and I hope that you'll, you'll come out and see it when it opens in April. So we're going to step inside. Um, again, our, our museum designer is in Washington, D.C., Healy Kohler Design, a wonderful company that did the Museum of the American Revolution in Philadelphia and many, many other projects around the country. And then our exhibit fabricator is 1220 Exhibits out of Nashville, Tennessee. They've done many projects, including the Dwight D. Eisenhower Presidential Library and Museum in Kansas, as well as many, many, many other projects, too many to name, but uh, really great teams that we're working with. And they're here every day. We have 15 or 20 people, I think, all together working on the museum at any given time. So let's step inside. We'll show you for the first time uh, some of what we're putting together here. And I think we might be in Tim's favorite area of the museum already. Uh, as much as we love the Civil War history, uh, this is prehistoric times, natural history. What are we looking at here, Tim? And maybe we want to start with... Uh, yeah, so Maria, um, you can come, well, I guess we should start over here. I don't have noise to spin around. But uh, these are our dinosaur footprints which again had been in storage for a number of years. Uh, some of you who visit, visited uh, Schmucker Hall uh, when we had our museum there probably saw these, but these are uh, footprints that were left, uh, were discovered at Trossel's Quarry in Latimer Township along Bermudian Creek in the 1930s during a uh, project where they were quarrying stone to build bridges and roads on the Gettysburg National Military Park. So um, uh, it's fascinating. And we have, uh, we actually contracted with a, uh, an actual uh, natural uh, artist. Um, this artist, uh, she had done uh, work with the Smithsonian and um, Healy Kohler uh, found her for us. And we discussed what we would like and she painted this one-of-a-kind uh, diorama of the type of dinosaur that probably made these footprints. Of course, we don't, we don't have a skeleton from the dinosaur at the quarry, just the footprints, but it's believed to be sort of an early um, uh, sauropodomorph. And we, we talked about we might have a contest among these Adam County children to name That's right. Maybe you could, even in the comments, tell us what you think we should call the dinosaur. Yeah. If there's any young people watching, we'd yeah. especially like your input. Um, but um, I'm just very excited about this. And, and these, this stone right here, I'm told, uh, you know, when they went, went to put it in, they kind of weighed it 400 pounds. Did they weigh it? Yeah. Well, and I should say, Tim carted this stone. <laughs> across the sidewalk <laughs> to our building from our storage building. And I have a video of that. We'll have to post it. It was pretty impressive. I then carted this much lighter, easier stone over behind him. Uh, uh, but we are excited about yeah. these. How old are these footprints, do we think? Um, well, you know, uh, depending on how you, you know, you date the stone, it's about 220 million years old. So it's, um, uh, you know, the Triassic period uh, that this dinosaur roamed what is now Adams County. Now, this thing that it is in, this holder that the museum designers created uh, will be uh, molded and painted and blended in so the dinosaur prints look kind of natural with the background. And they haven't done that yet. This is just sort of a, a, a placeholder for what they are going to do. But I, I got to tell you, there's a lot of people that are involved in the construction of the building and a lot of people that are being involved in the museum design and uh, a lot of their work is very impressive but the, this museum designer 1220 the fabricator out of Nashville Tennessee is very impressive they do really good work uh, yeah and we'll show you a little bit more of that as we get through the rest of the museum I want to just say two things one somebody just asked about again what was the opening date it's April 15th and 16th that's our opening weekend uh, maybe Tim will check to see if we have any other questions as well. I see we have almost 300 people watching, which is very exciting. Uh, we, we so appreciate you giving us your time this evening to see this. Um, and also, there's many of you have donated. Again, um, I'll do my job as a, a fundraiser again and say we have a special 
$1,863 matched tonight, $1,863. So every dollar you give is matched up to that amount. Uh, it will really help us get across the finish line with our capital campaign. Um, and on that note, I think we'll go to the, uh, another very exciting part of the museum yeah. just across the way here. Tim, why don't you explain what they've well, done we have a whole here. display on uh, Devil's Den. And, you know, as a uh, rock formation in our county, it's kind of uh, interesting. And, uh, I, you know, we came with this idea to have a Devil's Den rock formation as you come in. And uh, they just did a wonderful job with it. Uh, this is kind of interesting also because not only is this formation to pick Devil's Den, it also is a movie screen for one of our videos it's being produced by Jake Borat that will appear throughout the museum to tell the story of Adams County. Yeah, I'm not sure we've announced this yet, but uh, all of those media pieces, Jake Borat, of course, very well known for the Gettysburg story, uh, the, the doc documentary that uses drones to cover the Gettysburg battlefield. Um, but those pieces are also going to be narrated, they've already been narrated, uh, by Stephen Lang, the acclaimed uh, award-winning actor who's very famous for his roles in Gettysburg, Gods Absolutely. and Generals, and, of course, Avatar and... Avatar 2, which is now out in theaters and making billions of dollars. So uh, we are thankful, unbelievably thankful to Stephen Lang for donating his time to narrate these videos throughout the museum. Um, so why don't we walk into the, the next area. Um, again, I should have mentioned probably, but you may have gotten the, the idea that this museum is chronological. We love chronological museums because we can take you through time. Um, walking literally through the dinosaurs um, into the last 10,000 years or so of our history here in southern Pennsylvania, which uh, was dominated by the stories of Native Americans who lived here. Um, and we don't know a lot about these early peoples, but we do have hundreds, probably over a thousand artifacts in our collection, including spear points and arrowheads and axes and cooking stones. And so you'll get to see some of these artifacts and even touch one of them, a big hollowed out cooking stone used by local Native Americans. Uh, Tim, you want to maybe briefly just, I know we could, we could stay in here all night, yeah. but uh, this is one of Tim's favorite panels. It will have an artifact attached to it, but uh, none of the artifacts are in the museum yet. They got a nice uh, uh, drawing of uh, Emmanuel Bushman, who uh, is a character that uh, I've read lots of uh, newspaper articles by in uh, the 1800s, Gettysburg. Uh, and he's responsible for naming a place uh, south of town where a bunch of early Native American artifacts have been discovered, and that's Indian Field. So I have a little display about what Indian Field is or what is it supposed to be and how it came about. So I think people find these little local stories interesting when they're woven in with uh, uh, the story of the, the larger picture. That's great. And again, I mean, if you like Tim's videos and all the work he's done, this is basically another one of his books that you'll get to walk through and experience with all the imagery and the videos and the stories. Um, it's great that we've had him uh, to be the, the principal author of this museum. So um, we're walking into the next section, which is about the French and Indian War period. And you'll see that, again, as Tim noted, we have just wonderful museum scenic artists on, on site here and they've created uh, the bones of uh, a French and Indian War era structure, a log cabin. Uh, and we have some maps from the 1770s around the outside walls. And then, as Tim showed you earlier, we want to talk about the Mason-Dixon line and the conflict over where the line was between Pennsylvania and Maryland. And in that, that conflict resulted in, in murder, in, in, uh, in armed violence, and, and so many other really fascinating stories that we cover here. Um, and we do have a line running through the floor, a gold metal uh, line that symbolizes the Mason-Dixon line. And our Mason-Dixon mark is going to go kind of right here in the middle. Yep, it'll That's sit right on it. Like and of course one of the biggest stories in this section is the story of Mary Jemison, who was a young girl kidnapped by Native Americans and French soldiers in the 1750s here, not far from Gettysburg, near Cashtown, Pennsylvania. Uh, she was kidnapped, her family was killed, uh, she was the only survivor, and she went on to spend the rest of her life living with a Seneca in upstate New York. Um, and she's a, a very well-known figure um, during the French and Indian War. And also, um, actually today, many students in upstate New York learn about her story, but they probably don't know that that story began here, not far from Gettysburg, uh, during her kidnapping in the 1750s. So I think we've covered this area pretty well. Of course, there's many, many more stories and artifacts and exhibits that we have, uh, we have not yet uh, seen actually come together in this space. We do have, I should point out, one artifact that'll be going in this room uh, that I really particularly like 
and we found during the unpacking, it's a book owned by the Dobbin family uh, that owned the Dobbin house for many years, Alexander Dobbin. And the book was, uh, it's a religious text published in London in 1699. So one of our oldest paper documents on display. It will be on display here shortly. Tim, do you want to explain where we are now in, 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 in history? We have, a dis we have a display referred to as Revolutionary America. <laughs> And actually, uh, again, when I think back to the, our first discussions about the museum, I think we came up with this concept of uh, recreating uh, Samuel Geddes's tavern. And so uh, we, uh, I, sometimes I'm amazed that an idea that we came up with so early on survived and expanded and came through, and here it is. Uh, one of the things that surprised me most was I was under the impression that we were going to have like, you know, uh, recreation beams for the tavern, uh, you know, and make it look an old tavern. No, they used actual oak beams. I guess to create a fake oak beam, it probably cost as much as it does to use actual beams. And then the museum fabricators have uh, sort of weathered the beams and put in a wall that looks similar to a tavern. Now, besides the fact that this is a tavern um, you know, display, we are actually going to have museum cases in here displaying things on revolutionary Adams County, uh, James Geddes and the founding of our town, and I uh, think about towns and taverns in Adams County early on. And uh, one of Andrew's ideas early on was that we'd use the tavern uh, to have some audio creating an experience that we call colonial conversations. That's right. And a couple things. Well, Tim mentioned this beam. I just I think it's a good time to give a little nod to uh, a really incredible group of, of uh, workers from Conewago Enterprises, a local company in Adams County here that actually has built this entire building but especially spent the, uh, maybe a month, maybe three weeks in here building the tavern in one other area where they use these original, these, uh, these authentic solid oak beams, which I, I will say I tried to pick up one end of it and it did, it did not get far. Um, so it took a few of them to get them up, but they've actually put them in a, in a formation that actually uh, you can't see any screw holes, you can't see anything modern. So they really just a wonderful team of, of people. Um, and I'll give a shout out to Eric Sponseller, our foreman. If he's uh, watching this or maybe sees it one day, we've just had a great time working with him and he supervised this whole effort. So Tim did mention we have audio in here. It's directional audio. So if you're standing uh, behind the bar that will eventually come in here in the back or at a table, you'll hear the voices of the people in the tavern. Um, and we picked real characters, uh, real people, uh, in other words, um, who became the characters of this audio program, including Samuel Geddes, his son James Geddes, uh, their mother uh, and Samuel's wife, Isabella Geddes, Martha Geddes, a young girl, uh, as well as some other Scotch-Irish, early Scotch-Irish settlers who we've kind of created into colorful characters that you'll probably enjoy hearing them talk about, hearing the news of the firing of, uh, of uh, on the colonists at Lexington and Concord, um, or the, the signing of the Declaration of Independence, um, and also uh, emancipation, the gradual emancipation of Pennsylvania that began in 1780. Uh, and one last thing here, one of our favorite artifacts in our collection will go in this center case, and that is the original map of Gettysburg on animal hide, drawn onto animal hide in 1785. And Tim has written a wonderful script to go along with that that explains how towns like Gettysburg came about and the system of acquiring the lots in the town and a little bit about James Geddes, his background in the family's history. So you'll have to come and see this. There will be a real bar built into the, the back of this room. It will not serve alcohol, at least not yet. Um, but uh, we'll, we, we are really excited about this first kind of immersive experience that's built into the museum. Uh, do we have any more questions, Tim, that you've been sent? Just, we'll just continue to check questions. If you have specific questions, Michaela, our Director of Development, is, is watching the chat, but we're also going to be texting some questions to oh, Tim. No questions yet, but if you have them, let us know. And thanks again for your donations. It really does mean a lot to us. We could not do this without you. We could have never built this building without you. Um, it's very exciting for us, for the whole community, and for everybody who loves Gettysburg around the country. So, uh, moving out of the tavern, we're coming into a a portion of the museum that talks about the development of the area between the Revolutionary War and the Civil War. 
And that includes probably the, the star character of that period, which is Thaddeus Stevens. And uh, very soon we'll have artifacts that belong to Thaddeus Stevens in this case, as well as some stories about the Underground Railroad, uh, the early infrastructure, the development of Gettysburg, the building of the courthouse and the jail, the poorhouse, uh, and then a big open storage case filled with Tim's favorite artifacts. So, uh, you know, we tried to really strike a balance. Of course, we don't have artifacts everywhere because I've been at museums where it can get a little overwhelming when you just have text and artifacts covering every square inch. Of course, Tim probably would have loved that. <laughs> but uh, we tried to strike a balance. So we have some cases, though, that really are packed full of artifacts, including this one, which will be a big open case uh, with, I don't know, a, a dozen or more of our larger artifacts from before the Civil War. So we have drums and clocks and oil paintings and and guns and powder horns and hats and some other items that are just really interesting to look at and tell stories about some of the people who lived in the area before the Civil War. Anything else you want to add in this room? Um, well, we'll have an uh, iron stove from Thaddeus Stevens' Mariah Furnace, as well as this exhibit on Thaddeus Stevens. Yeah. So, Tim, you want to tell us about this area? And maybe we'll have Maria come through. Or actually, if she stays right there, she could probably get a good... Uh, a good shot of some of this here. Um, yeah. yeah, well, this is uh, going to be uh, Adams County in the Civil War. So we're going to have a large display case featuring items from Adams County soldiers. So, you know, we all know that we talk a lot about the Battle of Gettysburg and what happened in the Civil War at this location, but that was just three days of a war that lasted for four years and thousands of Adams County citizens served in the Union armies during the Civil War. So we're going to have um, uh, you know, paintings of Civil War soldiers, uh, we have uniform pieces, we have uh, a sword, a presentation sword, we have Guns, uh, bayonets. Uh, rifles, yep. um, bayonets. Uh, we're going to have the drum uh, from Company K, 1st Pennsylvania Reserves, in our display case. Uh, and this is the drum that was once at Charlie Weaver's Museum on Baltimore Street. And a private collector is putting it here on loan. So we have a, just a large amount of stuff about the local soldiers' experience. Right, and if you come out just a little bit, Maria, you'll see we also have a wall about the start of the Civil War um, and Abraham Lincoln's election in 1860. We'll have an original campaign ribbon. Uh, worn by a local resident during the Lincoln's election on that wall. And Tim loves to, to point out, we have an original newspaper article right here from the, the Gettysburg newspapers declaring the <clears throat> vote count in 1860 in Adams County. And, and you want to say, uh, I believe Abraham Lincoln yeah. uh, Abra won. Abraham Lincoln carried Adams County in the 1860 election by 50 point, like 2 percent of the vote. So Abraham Lincoln carried the county over his combined opponents by six votes. So it's very close in 1860. That's right. We'll also have an exhibit about uh, some of the tensions leading up to the Civil War, including um, how I mentioned earlier, we're so close to the Mason-Dixon line, and there were many instances where slave catchers came across the Maryland-Pennsylvania border and attacked some local families, including um, a woman named Mag Palm, who you may have heard of. She fought off her attackers in 1858, a couple of years before the Civil War, lived to tell the story, and we'll have her rocking chair uh, in our exhibit right here to tell that story to kind of help set up the Civil War years that we explored here. And then, Maria, maybe you could come around this way so we can get a good shot of uh, this wall. Tim really loves talking about what we have here. This was kind of a last-minute decision that we made to include. We wanted to do something that would represent what this area looked like at the time of the Civil War. And, and I think one of the best examples of that is this map that you see. Tim, do you want to explain what this it is? This is a John Batchelder isometrical map of the battlefield. It was actually drawn in 1863 and published in early 1864. And basically, you're hovering above the battlefield in a hot air balloon about three miles you know, from Gettysburg down the Baltimore Pike, and you're looking at the area where the battle was fought with the town. Uh, we, have a, we put a UR here on it, and you can see uh, the farms on the battlefield, uh, like the John Herbst barn uh, on the fire here, and uh, you know, the Manuel Pitzer uh, farm, for instance, and you can see Marsh Creek in the area where the Union and uh, Southern armies fought the battle in Cumberland Township. So it's, it's 
one of the maps that you just don't see as much used um, in this type of format, but we thought it would be kind of interesting to use it. And that really sets up the next section of the museum, which is probably the central or core experience that we have. Um, and so when you walk into the museum, uh, in, a, in a few months you'll notice a house sitting in the middle of the back of the, of the museum. Um, and we're going to talk about this in a minute. I just want you to take note of it. It is probably a central experience, the core uh, exhibit in the museum that we just can't wait for you to see. Uh, but that, the stories that Tim just talked about set up uh, the stories of the civilians here in Adams County and Gettysburg during the battle. Uh, and those are the stories that are just central to our identity as a community. We have hundreds and hundreds of these accounts, letters and diaries that were left behind uh, by the actual eyewitnesses of all ages who lived through the Battle of Gettysburg and lived through um, the aftermath of the battle, which is another story that really doesn't get enough attention. So you're, you're passing by a recreation of a house in Gettysburg at the time of the battle, and we'll return to that in just a second. But we're going to come around the corner here and uh, show you some of the exhibits that are being put together about the local residents in 1863. We have a few cases right here. Tim, maybe you could talk about uh, some of how we separated these out. Of course, right now it's a little bit chaotic because the museum designers and the museum fabricators are in here every day making changes and getting things ready. You can see some exhibit cases are being put in. Some have uh, gaps where they're going to be placed very soon. But what, what are we doing with this area, Tim? Well, we have, um, in this area, we have exhibits about Adams County civilians during the Gettysburg campaign. So we have a, a case about uh, June 26, 1863, the Friday before the battle when the Southern Army came through. Uh, we have a display case about July 1st, how the battle started, uh, what it was like for the people who lived in the town during the first day's fighting. We have a uh, uh, farms on the battlefield display about some of the farms and what happened in the farms on the, on the battlefield. And we have um, uh, exhibit about fighting in the streets of the town and what it was like at, on the edge of the town during the second and third day of the battle during the sharpshooter action. And in the cases are some of our, uh, you know, more famous artifacts that we'll have on display that some of you have seen over the years and we'll probably have some new artifacts that you haven't seen uh, on display also. That's and, right. We know one thing, um, walking through the museum, even on, in this construction phase, one of the things about the museum designers, Healy and Healy Kohler that we have from Washington, D.C., is our attention to detail. Uh, I'm just amazed by, at the very beginning, when they gave us a palette of colors and the paint choices that they used in the different areas of our museum. Uh, and you might notice that they're warm colors. <laughs> I, I, I think they blend together very well as you walk through the different galleries. And I, I want to take another moment to thank people. We've already raised $1,200 on this video in just a few minutes, which is just stunning. I think we have just maybe $500 left to get to our 1863 match tonight. So $5, $10, no matter what you give, it'll help us get to that threshold. And then we'll get that all or nothing 1863 um, to help us. And we are very close to completing our capital campaign. So... Uh, thanks for being part of this last final push uh, to get us across the finish line. Behind me is a projector area. Uh, basically, right now, it looks like an empty wall. But we have the Warren map of Gettysburg around that projection. And there will be a video on the central, the, the center part here where you see the, the blank wall. And that's another video produced by Jake Borat and narrated by Stephen Lang. And it's called Dawn of Battle. And uh, that video is meant to give you, in the actual words of the local residents, uh, an idea of what it was like as the battle approached, when the Confederates reached uh, the, the, the area of, of Gettysburg and Adams County, as they were closing in on the town, um, as the civilians are kind of bracing for impact and not sure what's going to happen. You know, in 1863, uh, the Confederates were about as terrifying as anyone could imagine for these local residents. They read about horrible things in the newspaper that, you know, the Confederates had destroyed towns and, you know, that they had, uh, um, you know, desecrated property. And, and of course, the Confederacy was, was uh, um, doing very well by July 1863. And so um, the, uh, the idea of Confederates occupying the North, occupying Gettysburg, was a, about as bad as it could get for these people to, in, in their imagination. And so uh, we are really, with this film, trying to recreate what that must have been like for them uh, to feel this sense of just incredible fear and, and, and anticipation of something 
awful that was about to happen. And so that film takes it from kind of the thousand foot level and narrows it in from a, a, a county to a town to a street and to a house. Um, and, and we kind of zero in on one family's experience. Um, and this is the first time we've talked about this in, in any format uh, publicly, but uh, we are extremely excited about what we're putting in here uh, to my right, and we're going to walk you right through it and show you how it looks right now. But we are building a recreation of a home that is caught in the middle of the Battle of Gettysburg. And not only will you be able to walk in and look at this scene, uh, but we will have a presentation, a light and, and sound presentation like no other, like nothing that's been done here in Gettysburg, to put you in that moment so that you can feel what it must have been like for a family caught in the crossfire of the battle. And that's what this room is called. It's called Caught in the Crossfire. We could not be more excited about it. We have been working on this for over a year, very quietly. We haven't talked about it too much, um, but it's just going to be a phenomenal asset to our museum and uh, very intense. So, you know, there will be loud noises and, and floors that shake and uh, the authentic sounds of battle. We actually went out to a firing range in Virginia and recorded real sounds. We fired live ammunition. Uh, we fired bullets through wood. We fired bullets through glass. We fired cannons through wood and captured all the sounds of the explosions and the impact and we are recreating this atmosphere. One, an, another very exciting thing we want to note is that this experience um, has audio of a family that is actually below you hiding in the cellar, and you'll hear their voices coming from, from below. And that script for that family, which was uh, put together based on real accounts of the battle, that script was written for us by none other than Jeff Shera, a good friend of the Historical Society, uh, one of the best authors out there, uh, and, and really, uh, I think he captured the, the, the fear and the chaos of this moment. And so we're recreating a scene in which the town is overrun by the Confederates and a family seeking shelter in their basement is trying to deal with the circumstances as they happen and, and to make life or death decisions. So, Tim, do you want to add anything else to that before no, we step we should, in? We should walk through. Okay. So this is the first time we've, we've really shown this room. It is still a work in progress. Uh, they are finishing the floor and working on the walls and uh, all of the special effects. But we did test this room with the audio presentation a few days ago. Um, and I will say it is just incredible. We will have a disclaimer on the outside. I know it won't be for everyone, uh, but we wanted to do something that is truly authentic to the experience of the people of Gettysburg during the battle as their town was overrun by an enemy force. So why don't you step inside and see? Um, you'll, you'll see the atmosphere that we're creating. Again, very, very early, this is gonna take you know, weeks to actually get it uh, into the state that it will be when you visit um, after April 15th when we open. But you can see we actually sunk the floor in this room so that we can recreate a cellar underneath where you will hear the sounds of a family hiding. You can see there's some light from underneath uh, as the family has some sort of a lamp. Um, you'll see that light moving below you. And then there are light boxes embedded in the windows. Uh, so you'll see uh, shadows of soldiers running back and forth. And if you come in, Maria, you'll notice one of, um, we want to show you one of the really fascinating things about this room is uh, there are bullet holes embedded in the walls that you will not see until uh, the bullets crash through the wall and you'll see a light flash appear um, to, to represent uh, what it was like uh, to be in a house that is literally caught in between the lines during the battle. And uh, another thing that most visitors when they enter won't know right away is that we have 13 audio speakers built into this one room. It's an 11.2 sound system. Um, that means there are 11 regular speakers and two uh, low frequency emitters that will actually cause the floors to shake with the impact uh, of shells. So it's hard to describe. I really can't do it justice. You will have to come and see it. But we are so excited about this room. We've been working on this nonstop. Um, Tim, do you want to add to that a little sure. bit? We'll wait till we get up okay, well, we have a couple questions. So, you know, I don't want to give away everything. You'll have to come and see it, but uh, it'll be an experience that, that uh, I don't think you'll get uh, anywhere else if you come to Gettysburg. And it really pays tribute to the, the severity of what this was like for the people of our, of our community. Um, I think that's a story that doesn't get across enough, that this was a really powerful and traumatic experience. Uh, for people, you know, sometimes as young as children, and you'll hear the voices of some children uh, that are below you in the cellar in this area. So uh, you'll have to come out and see it again. We won't give away everything, but uh, we, we think you'll really enjoy it. And we're going to really
really work hard to make sure the floor is free, uh, as they would in a historic, um, in, in a home of, of that time. I think Tim has a question. He is smiling, and so I bet that he is excited to, uh, to answer the question that we got. Uh, but I will, before he does that, I just want to point out when visitors step outside the back of the Caught in the Crossfire experience, which is about four and a half minutes, they'll see uh, a destroyed wall that represents the, the catastrophic damage to buildings in the town, especially wood buildings, where bullets and canister balls and artillery shells struck uh, the, the wood of a home. Um, and we used, do you want to mention where we got some of these relics? I know this is one of Tim's favorite things. <laughs> well, you know, it, was, it was kind of tough for us because we wanted to, some of the bullet holes, we wanted to stay have, have bullets and canister rounds in the holes, but what are we going to do, take a, uh, an object out of our official collection it was given us to preserve and put it in the wall? So we really couldn't do that. So I went home and got bullets from my private collection and and uh, we put them in the wall. So there are actual Civil War bullets in here uh, that I uh, gave to us so that the museum designers could put in the wall. We're really excited about and that. And an authentic artillery shell as well, up at the top. Um, oh, yeah. So we have there's uh, a, There's an artillery shell in the wall. And of course, you know, nine buildings in town have artillery shells sticking out of them to this day. So, you know, when you come, maybe, maybe as part of our scavenger hunt for kids, we'll hand out a map of the town that they can find the cannonballs. That's great. That's a good scavenger hunt. Um, someone, uh, Beverly, asked uh, Andrew, uh, when we were putting together the museum, there must have been things that I mentioned that we had included early in the museum concept that didn't really happen or got ca canceled at <laughs> one point or another. And I was thinking of something yes. that was going to go right here, that I had this idea. And uh, I think what happened, it, it, the idea uh, was very difficult to replicate, and uh, you just, uh, it went, as we went through different phases, it was an idea that did not come to fruition, maybe one day. But what I wanted to do was something here in the aftermath of the battle. You know that after the battle of Gettysburg, um, children went around the battlefield and collected uh, debris of battle. Bullets were found on the battlefield and they were sold to visitors to make money for some of these families. Imagine after the battle, the local community was devastated. Their crops were destroyed, their farms were destroyed, and their families needed money. And kids were finding things on the battlefield and selling them as souvenirs. And one thing that people really wanted to buy was artillery shells. But no one wanted to buy a live artillery shell. So the kids would disarm the artillery shell by taking the fuse out and pouring the powder out. But as time went by, uh, the, the brass fuse and the iron shell, it got more and more difficult to get the fuses out. And several children were killed. One of them, while trying to get the fuse out by banging the artillery shell against the rock, and it exploded. So I was thinking that we tell the story of the kids in Gettysburg and kids that were killed after the battle, which we will tell here, but I wanted to have a line of artillery shells and maybe have a sign saying, um, you know, something like, you know, which shell is heavier and encourage the kids to come over and pick up the shell. And of course it would be attached to a wire. And when you picked it up, a big sign would, a screen would come on and say, boom! And, you know, you just die. Do not handle artillery shells. Something like that. And shockingly, when we started telling the story of how we were going to put this in here, it did not go over very well with our audience. So, uh, unfortunately, that was sacrificed uh, to get us a little bit more back in the budget. Uh, but maybe one day Tim will get his wish, and we will have an exhibit where you can simulate... And, the explosion and, and I will scare a little kid out of yep. his mind. And that is, that is definitely uh, <laughs> your motive for, for that exhibit. Um, sometimes we maybe get our point across too much when we're, when we're, uh, we're trying to do this type of thing. But, uh, yeah, so that is a, that's a great question that someone asked. Of course, exactly you know, we about. have so many artifacts that we could not fit into this museum, and we yeah. will, over time, do our best to rotate exhibits. Of course, you know, that takes additional funding. We're going to continue to fundraise so that we can keep the museum fresh. But with some of these uh, interactive, immersive elements like 
caught in the crossfire, our room here. We hope that people will want to come back over and over again to pick up on different details that they may have missed the first you, you time. You know what's really interesting, and I didn't even think about this until the other day, but you know, you might look at this and say, well, come on, that's too many bullet holes in the building. No building in Gettysburg was damaged that badly. And then look what we put right here, the Jacob Stockhouse on Washington Street uh, after the battle, right across from it. So, yes, there were severely damaged buildings in town after the battle. Wow, and I see we're only 170 something dollars away from our, our goal for the video tonight. That is just incredible. I have to say, I am always so amazed by people's generosity to, to help us make this a reality. You know, we've been working long and hard to, to see this come together, and we could not have done it without any of you. I sincerely mean that. It has been an incredible community effort, and when I say community, I mean people here, but people all around the country who care about this place and its history. Um, and that's why we're able to put all this together. So. Thank you for being part of it. We cannot wait to show uh, all of you what we've been uh, we've been working on for the past uh, couple of years. So come on into this next area. It's a little bit packed because we've got some exhibit cases going in. But, you know, some of you might enjoy seeing what a museum looks like when it's being put in. I have never seen this before. Uh, I'm sure Tim has been in a few museums as they're opening. But it's always exciting for us to kind of see the, the, the mechanics of how everything fits together, how the audio and the visual and the effects are, are, uh, are combined with all of the cases and the graphics and the, and the colors. And, and uh, of course, all the artifacts. We have probably over 500 artifacts going into this museum. Um, and they will be coming in over the next few weeks uh, once the cases have been finished. Yeah. You want to explain what, what we have well, in this area? This, is, this room is called The Address. And, of course, this is going to be uh, things about the Gettysburg Address. And we have another one of Jake's uh, videos on the wall that will highlight the civilians of Gettysburg and the Gettysburg Address. And, again, one of the concepts I had early on in the process was a civilian wall of faces. When Healy Kohler uh, Design took us to Philadelphia to see the American Revolutionary Museum, which they designed, I was excited because they had a wall of uh, panels of photographs of American Revolutionary War veterans when they were older. Uh, and I thought, wow, we have lots of photographs of the civilians. We can put photographs of the civilians during the battle on this wall. There will be about 40 of them. And I have a little paragraph describing who each of them is on the panels. It looks really nice. Uh, we, we, we don't have them up yet, so we'll, we're excited to see that. Uh, we also have um, a display case here that you can see, the display case out, and we're going to end up putting that in the wall. But this display case will have objects dealing with David Wills, the Wills House, and Abraham Lincoln's visit, including a chair that was on the platform during Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. Yeah, we were really excited about this room. And we have, did you mention the program? In no, addition, did not. We have an original program, probably one of the rarest documents in our collection, an original program from the Gettysburg Address that will be displayed here uh, that was handed out that day. Um, I also was just told that we have passed the uh, milestone for our fundraising goal tonight. So thank you so much. That's eighteen sixty-three dollars. Uh, yeah, no, don't say that. We can never stop. That's, we we are, of course, we'll we'll accept, continue to accept donations. Uh, but we have reached our our uh, our match goal tonight. So that is wonderful, and we'll put every dollar to good use finishing this museum. Uh, we can guarantee that we're still uh, funding this project, although very close to the end of our our goal, which is another very comforting and exciting thing for us. So uh, why don't we come through here? I hear the HVAC system coming on, so we'll try to get out of the, uh, the area. I don't know if you saw this. Did you see this? Yes. So Tim and I were telling each other, uh, whether asking each other whether we noticed some of the things that were done just today. But if you turn around, uh, Tim will explain what, what we're looking at here in this uh, area of the museum. Of course, this section of the museum will handle the history of Adams County from the time of the Civil War to the present day. And, of course, we have uh, displays with uh, dealing with Adams County and the advent of commercialism and memorialization on the battlefield and the rise of agriculture. Of course, nothing was more dramatic in the history of our county than the emergence of the apple industry in the period after the Civil War. So uh, just today, uh, they put this panel on there that we have chosen of... Um, uh, you know, an orchard. Uh, I believe this is the Garrett's, Robert Garrettson's orchard 
uh, in Upper Adams County. And uh, this, is, this is a photograph that we colorized for this display with a, is it um, Deoldify, is that how you pronounce it? Uh, from My Heritage. Um, and uh, uh, throughout the museum, we have a few examples of colorized images uh, that we have uh, done on, on, our, on our display. And we, they're very popular when we do them on our Facebook site. It's phenomenal technology, and, and we're excited about using some of them. Of course, we have lots of black and white images, too. It's not all colorized, but we had picked a few areas where we thought it could really enhance. Of course, what better than having nice red apples in the apple area? Um, but for those of you who aren't native or uh, local to this area, I encourage you to explore the rest of, the, of Adams County. Um, just a, you know, 10 minutes north of Gettysburg, you get up into what we call apple country. And there's farmer's markets everywhere. There's beautiful views. There's uh, wineries, everything you could possibly imagine uh, related to this industry that's really blossomed and took off just after the Civil War in the 1880s when they began to first uh, commercially sell apples from Adams County. We're the largest apple growing county in Pennsylvania, I believe, Tim, mm -hmm. right? And I think maybe fifth or sixth in the country, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, that's what this exhibit's about. But we also have an exhibit about uh, pastimes and uh, some of the events of the early 1900s, late 1800s after the Civil War, including baseball. Um, Eddie Plank, you may know, is one of the most famous, probably the most famous athlete to come out of the Gettysburg area. He was a Major League Baseball pitcher for the Philadelphia Athletics, was a three-time World Series champion pitcher, I believe. Um, and uh, we'll have a bat that, that belonged to Eddie in this display, as well as many other artifacts related to baseball and uh, living in the area after the Civil War. Uh, we have exhibits about religion and culture and uh, um, and about the Spanish-American War, which is another topic that Tim is very knowledgeable about. Uh, in, in the center area here, we'll have an exhibit about the World Wars, World War I and World War II, both from the perspective of local soldiers who fought in these wars and what was going on here in our community during World War I with Camp Colt, the establishment of the first tank training camp in the United States, commanded by none other than Dwight D. Eisenhower, and during World War II, when there were two German and, uh, I would say, other um, Axis powers, uh, prisoners of war who were guarded at Gettysburg and at a camp just west of Adams County. So we have a lot of really exciting stories from the community, what was happening here, and also what was happening abroad uh, for these soldiers that fought in Europe and the Pacific. So um, some great artifacts. Uh, we actually have a, a Purple Heart from a local World War I soldier um, who was uh, killed in France, and one of our board members is the the, uh, the uh, descendant of that, of that individual. So, uh, Tim, you want to talk about, I would say, your two favorite artifact cases in the museum? Yeah, well, we have, <laughs> uh, we have a display case on memorialization in Adams County, or in you know, the Gettysburg area, mostly the battlefield, and how, after the battle, there were efforts to preserve the area where the battle was fought. And we have commercialization about the different uh, industries, and uh, businesses that came about because of the heavy visitation after the battle. Hotels, uh, licensed battlefield guides, uh, tourism, uh, and uh, you know artifacts. Uh, so we're going to have some displays on things that were sold around town. And uh, we have uh, something from the Gettysburg Electric Railway, the trolley, and other items relating to tourism and commercialization. So I really like that case. And then um, this section of the museum is more modern Adams County history. I think we termed this the recent past, which is a pretty good title. We keep changing our titles, and finally I think we have our final titles, but yeah. uh, the titles have changed quite a bit. But it is obviously chronological, so we start with dinosaurs, we end with uh, uh, the folks who have made an impact on our community over the past century. Um, so in this case, where Tim's standing over there, he just tripped over a big ball of blue tape. Uh, but we have uh, some stories about the suffrage movement in the 1920s, civil rights in the 1960s, um, and also some, some other topics related to uh, people who have made uh, significant uh, changes in, in, in our community uh, for the better. Uh, and that ties into, you want to, where were you pointing to? Well, just heard oh, some noises. We just heard, uh, I think, the uh, heating system. Oh. <laughs> I think. I hope. Oh, we'll find out. Um, but uh, behind us here, we'll have a, a wall of faces that honor 
uh, more individuals who've made an impact on the community over the past century. It's called our modern wall of faces. That's what we call it. Um, but it'll honor those individuals who uh, who passed away, but who made an impact on Gettysburg and Adams County um, in their lifetimes. More and modern. You more may recent. have seen we put out a request amongst our members of people that they thought maybe should go on this wall. Uh, we decided uh, that we put people on this wall who we all know that contributed to our history in the last 50 or so years. And uh, uh, a bunch of people were chosen. We actually have them so they're going to be able to be rotated. So we continue to change the people who we can put on this wall. But I chose people like uh, Charles Gladfelter, who the research room is named after. Uh, I chose uh, Charlie Weaver. And as historical figures, I chose Wee Willie Sherdell, the pitcher for the St. Louis Cardinals from McSherry's town, and Oscar Shaw, who was an uh, actor who lived in Adams County that was in the movie The Coconuts with the Marx Brothers. People like that, but other people nominated, uh, you know, uh, people that they knew from the county or they thought had a major impact on Adams County over the years. Um, uh, uh, for instance, the first uh, woman tour guide, Barb Shop, is on this wall. That's right. And the first uh, woman to graduate from Gettysburg College, right. Cora Hartman Berkey. That's right. Yeah. Is that her name? Yeah. Uh, she's on the wall. And Jesse Van, who was a, a local resident yeah. who went on to become one of the biggest philanthropists and business owners mm -hmm. in Pittsburgh. She owned the Pittsburgh uh, Courier, I believe, yeah. uh, which was the largest black weekly, black run weekly newspaper in the country of her time. So there's a lot of stories. Some you're gonna know, some you've probably never heard of before, but it's a nice way to kind of end the museum. Um, and we do wanna mention uh, for uh, those maybe who aren't as, as interested in the more local topics, we'll have a big central display here on Dwight and Mamie Eisenhower, probably the most famous people to ever live in Adams County. And so we have incredible artifacts. We have Eisenhower's will, a portion of his will. We have a, the pen they used to register to vote in Adams County. We have uh, some, a couple of Mamie's hats, at least one of her hats on display, um, and many, many other Eisenhower-related artifacts and stories. And then on this wall, we're actually recreating something that was done in our museum uh, in Schmucker Hall 20 years ago, probably 30 years ago, where we had a wall of faces of, of showing all of the presidents who have visited this community over the years, starting with Abraham Lincoln. Uh, by our count, 26 presidents have visited Adams County uh, in their lifetimes, not necessarily while they were in office. Um, starting with Lincoln, I think we're down to 24, 23, or 24. Of course, you know, we say start with Lincoln because George Washington passed through this area. Uh, James Buchanan definitely passed through this area. And uh, William, is it Henry William Henry Harrison, Harrison yep. came through the area. That's right. So Gettysburg was not perhaps as obscure as you'd think because we did have some, some prominent people visit before the Civil War. But, of course, Lincoln uh, set about a long tradition of presidents visiting Gettysburg that has continued all the way up through the present. Perhaps we'll add more presidents to the wall over time. Uh, but it's a nice way to, um, you know, a nonpartisan way to, to show that this has been a place for all presidents uh, to visit and, and, and enjoy and, and uh, reflect. So that uh, ends this part of the museum. Our final exhibit, we have a short film, kind of an exit video to summarize some of the stories throughout the, um, the museum. But we also have a, a small exhibit related to popular culture and how this community, especially Gettysburg, has been featured in, in uh, speeches by presidents and in television shows and uh, um, in movies, and, and of course there have been movies about Gettysburg, like the famous 1993 or 4, 94, uh, 93 uh, uh, movie Gettysburg, and we have uh, the original manuscript for the Killer Angels on loan, and, and it will be displayed in this last exhibit. So, um, a lot of stories that kind of uh, bring the, our visitors all the way up to, to the present. Uh, this is a, a, a not a huge museum, but we, we've done a lot with it in terms of um, using as much of the space as we can to display our collection, but also adding some creative things uh, that you won't find anywhere else here in Gettysburg. Yes, and we will end by showing you something that is sitting out in the hallway uh, that is going to be brought into the museum probably, probably in the next week, maybe tomorrow. Uh, but I think this might be, of all the things that have been fabricated and, and uh, recreated for, for display in the museum, I have never seen Tim as excited and happy as he was when this thing arrived on a big truck from Nashville, Tennessee. 
um, maybe three or four days ago. Um, so I want you to get a look at this while it's sitting in our, in our cafe. <laughs> of course, it will not stay uh, in the cafe. It will go into the museum very soon. Tim, why don't you uh, end our little program tonight by explaining what well, this is. And this what this will be in the museum uh, between the aftermath case and the display on Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. And this is a recreation. This is not a real tree. This is made out of uh, uh, different uh, kinds of plastics. And uh, it does have an actual artillery shell cannonball in the tree. That's an actual cannonball in the tree. But this is a creation of the Sherfy cherry tree that stood alongside of the Sherfy house uh, near the peach orchard in Gettysburg was struck by a 12 pound solid shot during the battle and this tree remained next to that house with the cannonball embedded in it for close to 70 years before the tree finally uh, had to be removed because it, the tree had died. And the family of, um, the, the Sherfy family actually took the cannonball out. They saved the cannonball and in the 1940s, they donated the cannonball to the Adams County Historical Society. I think it was just 40s, it could have been the 60s. <laughs> but um, I think it was the um, granddaughter of Joseph Sherfy who donated it to us and um, this isn't the actual cannonball. We have the actual cannonball that was in this cherry tree, and it will be in a case in display in our museum besides the tree. That's right, yeah. We actually, this is another cannonball. It's from an unidentified location on the Gettysburg battlefield. We uh, FedExed that cannonball to Nashville, Tennessee, uh, very carefully packaged, um, and they recreated this tree with that real cannonball that visitors will be able to touch when they make their way through the aftermath section of the museum. Um, and you can see the museum uh, folks, the artists and uh, designers have a lot of things set up here in this area. They're creating the tavern bar, they're working on the tree, they're doing some painting for other areas. Uh, but we could not be more excited every day. I know I've used that word a lot, but every day we come in and we see new things and, and it's the product of all this generosity that is, that is just poured in over the past couple of years to make this a reality. Um, and it's such an important story that our community has never had its story told. And this is now going to, to solve uh, that, um, that problem and, and to create something, I think, really wonderful um, out of uh, that void. So uh, thank you for supporting it. Thank you for, um, for taking this uh, virtual tour with us tonight. Uh, we, again, we're opening April 15th and 16th that weekend. We will have timed entry ticketing available on our website very soon, probably in the next month or month and a half. Um, so you can reserve your time to enter the museum uh, and, and see for yourself uh, what it'll be like. Uh, but thank you for your support. Thank you for watching tonight and all of your donations. I just were blown away over $2,000 raised in what, an hour or something. Um, but uh, it's just been a pleasure to be back with you. We're going to try to do more of these preview tours as things move along in the museum and in other areas of the building. And we'll see you in April. So have a wonderful night, everybody.